Oh, Lara, baby, you know, like they used to say, if the mountain does not come to Mohammed, Mohammed will go to the mountain. Like my mommy used to say, that was you go, Jesha, I told you should go. My name is Uzo Madu and I'm the founder of What's In It For Africa. So there what I do is follow um, EU Africa current affairs developments. I blog about them, write about them for external publications um, and also present an online show. <laughs> What inspired me to start What's In It For Africa was really um, working in EU current affairs and communications for about four and a half years. I was working on EU issues but also global issues and what I noticed is that the African voice either was non-existent or not very loud. Um, and that's not to presuppose that I'm representing the African voice but what I do is I allow a platform for African voices to be heard. And so the show is really about connecting um, African viewpoints to EU policy issues that matter for them. The future of what's in it for Africa is a lot more blogging, a lot more writing and a lot more content. So at the moment we're an online platform, um, but we would love to see more coverage of EU Africa current affairs issues, both um, at the EU level, um, especially in the context of Brexit, but also at the African level, um, looking at what media outlets are already out there and really getting a, a more nuanced view on the EU Africa relationship. So Brexit for Africa is quite a, a difficult topic actually. Um, I've written about it um, on, on several occasions and I think one of the things that we need to really consider is there are a lot of challenges but now we have to deal with the opportunities and the challenges that I see is you know a reduction of influence from the UK when it comes to EU discussions and we know that the UK has been able to temper some of the protectionist policies when it comes for instance to agriculture um, so I think that would be a real loss I also think their contribution to development aid which um, a lot many African countries rely on for budgets support for, for government or um, expenditure. But now we have to look at the opportunities and the reality is here. Theresa May has delivered the letter and the EU is now preparing their strategy. And so what we need to look at is really how African countries can leverage um, their position uh, towards the EU vis-a-vis um, -vis the UK and really make better trade deals with the UK and hopefully also with the European Union. I would see myself as um, enabling people to have access to information, so a platform that delivers sort of niche um, or delivers information that's not easily accessible or not um, very well covered or covered at all. So, for instance, I write about the European Union and the fact that it was 60 years old in, in March. But actually, what relationship does that have to Africa? Well, they were incorporated into the Rome Treaty, which established the European Union, um, and at that time, they were colonies. So I think um, it's all about making sometimes not so accessible information accessible. It's very important to have a narrative when you're telling a story. I think that we just have to be honest about where that narrative is coming from and be very transparent about the perspectives that we're putting forward and who is involved in our storytelling. Um, I quite often say that, um, actually, I'm borrowing this from a very good friend, um, and he says that actually Africa needs an Al Jazeera, uh, a narrative that they can speak to that is made by them for them. Um, and I think that's how important narratives are. I think that in the era of fake news, it's a problem globally. Um, and I think in the African context, and actually I, I think it's a, a more of a general context, um, is that misinformation has always been an issue. And I suppose 
actually that's where it comes a bit more specific to Africa that misinformation and you know misleading narratives about the continent has always already existed and I think it comes um, to a solution is about Africans owning their own narrative and speaking from their own truths um, in terms of fake news and really a way of eliminating that or reducing that I think it's about facts and statistics you know people say that it's not trendy anymore to kind of you know bombard people with facts and that's not what I'm saying but people like Afro Barometer or Africa Check they're doing some great work on checking things in real time um, with really thorough analysis and I think we need to depend more on these types of um, academic and research institutions for our, our news and our content. I think that the diaspora play, it plays an important role, but I think we shouldn't also take the role of people that are on the continent and doing um, very amazing things, very interesting things, and really understand the context within which they're, they're living in. I think the role of the diaspora is to offer any assistance, um, information, connection, networks that we can from wherever we are placed. Um, we've talked a lot um, at the LSC Africa Summit about access to finance, for instance, and I think that, you know, having access um, to financial institutions in the UK, in the US or wherever it may be in the Western world is a very important advantage that we can think about leveraging for people on the continent. Oh baby, oh baby, what's wrong with you, oh baby? We came to ball, I said MP, we can pay your bills, I said MP. I can't push, I said no man, I got some more. The theme built for Africa, I think, is very important, um, kind of harking back to what I was talking about in terms of African ownership of media and, and the services and content, because for a very long time, and even now to a certain extent, there has been an aspect of um, Africa being told what to do or advised what to do um, quite heavily from other people that have interests in the continent. And so I think it's really refreshing to talk about solutions, um, not just dwell on the challenges, and talk about how we can move the needle on things in a realistic way and how we can do it ourselves. And I think this uh, particular topic is, is extremely um, important to me and I think it's extremely important to everyone, so it's very beneficial. My dream for Africa, that's a very big question and um, I think that I probably share um, the same dream as, as everybody else who, who cares or has family or interests on the continent and that's really to have development that works for poverty reduction. Um, growth is great and we've seen a lot of that over the continent, um, really, really fast growth um, in many countries. But what we want to see is that translated to the reduction of poverty, for people to live with dignity and for people to have jobs that they're proud of and that they're ambitious about and that they care about. And I think, you know, human dignity is, is what we want for Africa. Come here, baby Bobby. Don't mind that girl. The biggest challenges that I've noticed covering EU Africa current affairs is really the ownership of African um, decisions. And I say that because um, whilst the African Union has made a lot of progress over you know, the, the, the decades that it's been in existence, especially in security and peacekeeping, it's done some fantastic work. There is still the issue that it's externally funded. Um, most of it is externally funded, actually. And I think um, once we get to a stage where we can really support ourselves in the decisions that we make, then we will really be getting somewhere. You didn't sound too happy. <laughs> no, I know, it's a bit of hesitation. I was like, I, I thought I did well, and then he's coming. <laughs> The shop guy, back it up, yeah. I'm on your back, baby. Ali, yeah. Cause if like that, don't try, baby, don't try. You are not.